Okay, so welcome to another episode of the State Security Series. Today, I'm joined by Maurice Uenuma uh, of Tripwire. Uh, pleasure to have you here today, Maurice. Great to be here. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, really, I just wanted a discussion today um, to kind of get your insights into some of the, the trending topics in the cybersecurity world. Um, and where I really wanted to start was just to kind of talk to you a little bit about your journey into cybersecurity. I'd love to hear more about the path um, to get you into this, the industry, and what was the moment you realized that cybersecurity was for you? Yeah, certainly. So I took an unusual path into the industry, uh, frankly. Most of my background as it relates to security uh, was really tied to uh, military operations, physical security, executive protection, and so forth. I spent uh, 13 years in uniform, uh, four years at the Naval Academy, nine years in the Marine Corps, and then as kind of a second career, went into the IT services industry, and that's where I began to learn and delve into really the central nervous system of modern day life, uh, being being IT information systems. And then over time was able to kind of fuse that together, and that fusion was completed when I worked at the uh, Council on Cybersecurity, which we merged with the Center for Internet Security, and then subsequently Tripwire. Uh, and now I'm now I'm hooked. Great, yeah, and I mean, I know you mentioned their Center of Internet Security, and obviously, I know a lot of people in the industry are very aware of that that organisation. So that gives you a really good insight and, and sort of grounding into cybersecurity. So no, that's interesting to hear that insight. Um, I mean, over the past year, uh, year or so now, things have been very different in the world. You know, we've, we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, and you know, the, the, the change from the way people were working a year ago. Is, is massive. You know, people are now working in a remote environment. Um, you know, people have been scrambling to p p pivot to support the virtual workforce. And um, what advice would you give people and organizations when it comes to securing the remote workforce? I think it's uh, tempting to look at any new technology related problem as a technical problem and delve into some of the uh, technical and architectural aspects of it. So uh, in the case of remote workforce, uh, right away kind of thinking about all of the implications of uh, having uh, additional desktops and VPN connections and uh, collaborative uh, workspace platforms online and so forth. I think the first and foremost thing to do is to remember that it is a security challenge we're talking about. And so to reference well-established security best practice frameworks and standards and compliance regimes, and, and then think about how that then becomes uh, realized in a new environment. So in other words, the same type of uh, standards, right, uh, that are put forth by CIS, by NIST, by ISO, need to be now applied in a world where uh, there is a much more geographically distributed workforce Critical workloads are shifting as a result. The enterprise has less control over the network. Uh, and so some of the tools and techniques and processes need to accommodate uh, greater emphasis on endpoint protection, identity access management, virtual collaboration, and so forth. But the starting place needs to be uh, the same, and that is uh, well-established cybersecurity best practices. Definitely, yeah. Uh, good point. Totally agree with that. And I, I mean, obviously, this has kind of been new for a lot of people. Um, some people have always worked remotely like myself. Other people have always been in that office environment. Um, but as you know, people have now moved away, I doubt there's ever going to go back to the previous way of working. I think there'll always be this hybrid virtual workforce now. And what impact will that have on security programs moving forward? Yeah, rather than a aberration from the norm, I think the COVID impact on a virtual workforce has really accelerated a trend that was already underway, meaning greater distributed uh, workforce and workloads and a general decoupling of uh, critical information and virtual uh, information systems and assets from physical environments that the enterprise could, could control, whether it were uh, it was uh, uh, data centers that they operated and the transition more and more of infrastructure up into cloud hosted environments uh, or uh, the network itself in an office environment. Right now, the enterprise is reliant on connecting through home networks that their employ employees are managing 
at home in uh, kind of collaboration or as a uh, customer of local ISPs and sharing that network with their kids who are doing virtual school and also uh, entertaining themselves, right, with online gaming and so forth. And so uh, that that's the challenge now is, is as we consider this acceleration and this decoupling, I think the shift from a cybersecurity standpoint is going to shift uh, away from managing physical infrastructure and more and more toward things like containerized, virtualized uh, assets, uh, workloads, uh, and identities, right, that uh, need to be um, accessible in an intermittently connected fashion. Yeah, and that's a really good point you make about, um, you know, interaction, you know, how people are, are going to have him to do homeschooling. Um, and, you know, I've seen different stats about, um, you know, parents letting their children use devices um, that potentially are connected to a corporate network. And that is going to be a real challenge for organizations moving forward to, to make sure they can monitor that and detect, you know, things that shouldn't be happening on those networks. So, no, interesting point. And the other part I wanted to talk about as well, Maurice, was uh, security and compliance. Um, so mm -hmm. they are quite often, a lot of people talk about them in the same breath, like they're, they're almost uh, the same thing, um, when th we know they're not. Um, you know, in your experience, um, you know, how can security and compliance teams work together to actually create a winning alliance um, as opposed to sometimes be against each other? Yeah, I think it's uh, two parts. First, recognizing the differences, and then secondly, uh, recognizing the commonalities and leveraging the commonalities to kind of mutual benefit. So the differences are, right, as, as security professionals, we know that you could be compliant but still not really fully secure. Uh, and, and that um, you could be secure but still miss some compliance uh, checks or compliance requirements because of the uniqueness of whatever compliance standard needs to be adhered to. Uh, so there are some differences. Typically, there's an emphasis, a difference in terms of um, prioritization. There could be an emphasis in, uh, there could be a difference in uh, who is actually managing it. You might have a GRC team worried about compliance and audit preparation, whereas you may have a security operations team uh, in another part of the organization, right? So it could be different people uh, and different tools could be used as well. Again, going back to GRC, say, versus a SIM platform as the primary uh, eyes on glass in a, in a SOC environment. So there are some differences. We need to understand and recognize those. Uh, but at the same time, recognize that there are tremendous commonalities. And the commonalities are typically in where the um, security strategy comes from, often cybersecurity best practices and frameworks. And typically, those same types of frameworks and, and associated standards are the basis for uh, the compliance requirements, right? Whether it's PCI DSS or HIPAA or SOX or FISMA or NERFSIP or whatever. So uh, they're often pointing back to NIST standards. They're pointing back to CIS controls. They're pointing back to ISO and so forth. So by recognizing that then, there is uh, the potential for kind of mutual reinforcement, uh, spending and prioritization that is going to prepare for an audit could help security improve its posture Right and the and the security uh, readiness of the entire organization, and conversely, some of the investments that are being made from a security standpoint. Let's say to gain greater visibility into um, unwanted, unauthorized access or or events on critical uh, uh, systems. That in turn is often going to map to a compliance standard. So, by by mapping those commonalities together, I think the two functions can uh, support each other. Yeah, I agree. I think collaboration is definitely key, especially when we kind of see how the threat landscape is changing. Um, you know, cyber attacks are changing constantly. Um, you know, we see things like ransomware has evolved massively over the last couple of years. Um, but based on your experience and your insights, what you see, you know, talking to customers and things like that, what are the biggest threats right now that companies should be focusing on? Um, I think in many ways, the threat landscape has... Um remains similar in that, in general terms, most uh, cyber, uh, cyber threats are in the form of financially motivated cyber criminals. Uh, then there is also, um, there are also kind of advanced persistent threats that are associated with nation states trying to undermine critical infrastructure or steal uh, important intellectual property and state secrets and so forth. 
That hasn't particularly changed that much, but the environment in which we're operating has, and this goes back to uh, my earlier points, right, about kind of this decoupling of physical infrastructure and controlled, architect well-architectured environments, and having to now adjust to how do we protect more and more uh, workload that is uh, uh, being done in, in virtualized environments, in multi-cloud or hybrid environments. How are we going to handle a distributed network that includes home, home networks? And how are we going to protect containerized uh, workloads? At the same time, more and more of our digital life is connected to physical life as well in the sense of control systems. So uh, some of the key challenges are how do we protect, continue to protect uh, virtualized workloads in the cloud? How are we going to protect containerized workloads? Um, how are we going to manage uh, distributed identities? Uh, and the zero trust model, by the way, comes into this conversation as well. And then how do we protect control systems in everything from industrial environments to building management systems to life support systems uh, that we all depend upon? Yeah, yeah, that is, it's a really good point. I, and I think you're right. Um, you know, Frex will always continue to evolve, but the landscape doesn't change massively. It is more about the environments we work in now. Um, so no, I, I agree. I think it's, that's a good point. And the next point I wanted to kind of think about as well was, um, you know, when it comes to CISOs and communicating uh, a return on investment to other stakeholders, what advice and tips could you share with those CISOs? Um, you know, how do they get buy-in? How do they get more budgets? Um, what are your thoughts on that, Maurice? I think we've all learned by now it's nearly impossible to uh, accurately quantify ROI in any sort of security investment. Uh, because security inherently is a process of dealing with unknown futures. So it's always tough. Um, there are, of course, some ways to measure the financial impact of breaches via, you know, the average cost of a breach to an enterprise or uh, financial impact per record stolen and so forth, right? That data is available. But ultimately, it comes down to each organization looking at its own place in the world and understanding what it can tolerate and what it cannot. Uh, what it can do with some of its risks. This is risk management, right? Do you uh, mitigate it? Do you transfer it? Do you share it and so forth? Uh, and that is going to drive a lot of, this, of the discussion. So I think an important part of it is understanding the identity and purpose of the organization and being able to speak to that. So uh, it is very much tied to that, that identity, right? For example, for banking and financial services, the integrity of financial transactions is critically important for uh, uh, critical infrastructure are owner operators, right? The reliability of control systems to support life and limb is very important. Uh, and in the automotive industry, safety is important, right? And so being able to tie a, a security investment message back to that, recognizing that we can't perfectly quantify it in, in any case is I think going to be an important skill. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good summary. Uh, thank you. Um, so I also wanted to just talk to you about security programs too. Um, you know, if you went to an organization tomorrow and maybe they don't have a security program in place or maybe it's really old and it needs rejuvenating, what three or four areas would you tell organizations to focus on? It's not going to be anything new or earth shattering, right? It's going to be focusing on security control, uh, security culture because uh, people still remain the greatest attack surface, the most vulnerable attack surface in any organization. So training, education, awareness, and, and culture is going to be important. Uh, being able to protect virtualized and containerized environments going forward. The integrity of critical systems and understanding the state and the changes occurring on those critical systems is, uh, is very important. And then I would say, finally, control systems, cybersecurity. Okay. Yeah. Good overview. Uh, yeah. Appreciate that insight, Maurice. Um, that was, that's the end of the, the main questions I had. I also have uh, a few rapid fire questions as well that I'd like to ask you. Um, so there's sure. just going to be a few questions. There's, there's going to be nine in total. Uh, don't think about them too hard. Um, and we'll see what comes out. Does that sound all right? Let's do it. Okay. So what cybersecurity newsletter do you read on a regular basis? Uh, I tend to read dark reading and, uh, and of course, the State of Security blog. Of course. Um, and I'm not sure if you're on Twitter at all, but you know, if you want to get to LinkedIn or something like that, you can. But what one cybersecurity account should everyone be following on Twitter or on LinkedIn? 
I, uh, so I personally am not on Twitter, uh, generally speaking, but I would follow uh, most frequently uh, Krebs, Krebs on security. Okay, yeah, you're not the first person to say that, so uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people would agree. Um, this one uh, is an interesting question, but I would love to hear, what's the one data breach, in your opinion, that made the industry sit up and really pay attention? Um, historically, there have been a number of them, but I would say recently it's been the, the solar winds breach, right? In the sense that it did several things. Number one, uh, it was a breach, or actually series, if you include FireEye, of uh, breaches that hit at the heart of the cybersecurity industry. And I think that really unnerved people. Secondly, many of their customers, like our customers at Tripwire, are uh, federal government agencies and critical infrastructure owner operators. That also unnerved people. And then finally, the uh, degree of sophistication and the fact that we are still trying to understand the full scope uh, of that breach or really series of breaches, uh, I think is really causing everyone to sit up and take notice uh, and think about everything from uh, the security of their own networks to, to their supply chain. Yeah, I, I think as well the impact on sort of the everyday person that isn't even within the industry. I think a lot of people were aware of this when it happened and they probably learned a thing or two about cybersecurity as well. So yeah, that's, that's a really good one to highlight. Um, what's the most misused cybersecurity term out there? You know, I think I think pointing to a, a APTs or advanced persistent threats, right? I think it's overused. Frankly, it's uh, it's always um, easy for a self-respecting organization to say uh, only an advanced persistent threat could have uh, brought us down, but in reality. It's, it's typically the lack of uh, uh, effective cyber hygiene at scale that is our undoing. And typically the attackers are not as sophisticated as we would like to believe they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so I know we're not really attending events at the moment, but you know, when we're back there, uh, based on your experience, what's the best conference to attend? RSA conference to me is kind of the default go-to. That's where you get the, the broadest sense, I think, of everything at multiple levels. And then kind of at a higher level, I really like the Gartner Security and Risk Management uh, summits. And hopefully we'll be able to go to them again soon. Eh? Indeed. <laughs> um, so who's your biggest inspiration in the industry? Many fine people in the industry. I think one that I've had the uh, privilege of working with and learned a lot from is Tony Sager at CIS. Uh, he's been a guest, of course, here with us at Tripwire, and is just a great human being and someone that uh, we uh, continue to learn from. Yeah, I echo that as well. Um, if you were going to just give some one bit of advice um, to you know to help someone improve their personal digital security, what would be the one thing you would tell everyone they must do? For consumers. Uh, and small businesses, I would point them to the Cybercrime Support Network uh, at uh, fraudsupport.org or fightcybercrime.org. Uh, actually, a friend of mine, a former CIS alum, Kristen Judge, is the founder and CEO of that organization. It's a nonprofit that provides great resources for individuals that just don't know where to start, uh, have been the victim of some sort of fraudulent cyber-related uh, crime or criminal activity or suspected criminal activity. Um, and, uh, and there are some great resources that uh, she and they make available in a very easy to access way to learn more and to take very concrete steps to, uh, to protect themselves and recover. Great, yeah, and that's what it's all about. It's having access to something that's easy to understand because obviously a lot of people are, are impacted by data breaches on a daily basis now. Um, so no, that's a great resource. I'll have to check it out. I'm not aware of that one. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, what's your favorite cybersecurity book? Uh, this is an oldie but a goodie, but cyber, uh, Cybersecurity and Cyber War by Singer and uh, Friedman was a, a great book that helped me to kind of understand what cybersecurity was uh, as I was uh, delving deeper into the industry. So that's a, that's a favorite still for me. Great. And then this is the last question, uh, arguably the most important. Pineapple on a pizza, is that acceptable? <laughs> well, I love pizza, and I live in Chicago where pizza uh, reigns. And I love Hawaii, but generally, no. Okay. Great. Thanks, Maurice. Uh, thanks for answering all those questions. Really appreciate your time today, um, and hopefully we'll chat again soon. Thank you.
Absolutely. Thank you. Great to be here.